Hello. We're really glad that you found us. We are a church family made up of all sorts of people. We come from different backgrounds. If you just Jesus. Our desire is for people to know Jesus. To know that they are loved by him. And to be part of a family who do life together. With Jesus at the centre. We meet up every Sunday to worship. And be family together. All seeking to demonstrate Jesus' love to others through being rooted in Christ and growing in love. Whether you're familiar with church or not, you are very welcome at One Christian Centre. As we celebrate together, we hope you engage with us. As we make Jesus known. Hello, my name's Emma Wall, and it's great to be with your church family here this morning. I thought I'd start by giving you a bit of context as to how I've ended up here today. Back in July 2019, I was a speaker to leaders on a primary age camp at Hill House, where I met Jackie Steer, who was also a leader on it. When she got back to Bristol, she, she suggested to her husband, John, that I might be prepared to come and preach here one morning. After a few emails back and forth, I was duly booked to come and speak in June 2020. And then, of course, you know what hit the country and shut everything down. When John emailed me again in September 2021 to rebook me, we'd just taken on the leadership of one of Ebby's home groups as its leaders had moved away to Chepstow, and there were other things that we'd got responsibility for, and I had to say that it just wouldn't be possible for the foreseeable future. Now, we jump back 28 plus years, when in my mid-twenties, I was a tent leader at Hill House and had a lively group of girls in my tent that included four zany 14-year-old friends who were quite a handful, might I add. I thought that they were so fab that I asked to be their tent officer for three consecutive years until they were 17. Imagine my surprise when a few months ago, one of those girls, all grown up now with two teenagers of her own and a very responsible job, got in contact with me via my husband's work email and asked to meet up to see if I'd be up for chewing the cud with her now and again. In the course of that conversation in pret a Cribs Causeway, she said to me, I thought that you'd been due to speak at Bourne, not knowing that some of the responsibilities that had prevented me from rebooking were literally due to come to an end over the coming weeks. I'm a strong believer that God gives us nudges in life and that we'd be wise to act on them. This, I felt, was nothing short of a God nudge. So that afternoon in March, the minute I got back home, I emailed John to say that I felt it was right to make myself available again. And so here I am because of what I felt was a nudge from God and because of your very own Vicky Payton. Over the past five months, I've waited on God for what he wants me to bring to you today. And the title that I've given to these things is Inwards, Outwards and Within. Let me begin inside your walls. In the NIV, Isaiah 58 verse 12 reads, Your people will rebuild the ancient ruins and will raise up the age-old foundations. You will be called repairer of broken walls, restorer of streets with dwellings. In the message, the same verse reads, You'll use the old rubble of past lives to build anew. Rebuild the foundations from out of your past. You'll be known as those who can fix anything. Restore old ruins. Rebuild and renovate. Make the community livable again. Often our old rubble is painful and feels valueless and redundant in the way somehow. Something to be avoided. Later on, I will be talking how in life we can make our old rubble our disappointments, our pain matter if we choose to, so that nothing is wasted. 
In the Believe in God Bible study that I recently led my women's group through, Beth Moore writes, remember God in your past, believe God in your present. This is the stuff of transformation. I believe that restoration changes things, transforms them. In his book on resilience called Bouncing Forwards, Patrick Regan, the founder of Kintsugi Hope Courses, writes, hope becomes tangible in the here and now if you believe that God is in the restoration business. What might hope, tangible in the here and now, look like for us? I felt this verse for you born, Hosea 2 verse 15, I will make the valley of Achor a door of hope. What if your loved by you community takes a peek through your door and glimpses hope? Born, what if your door is a gateway to transformation, a threshold over which things can change for people? Or maybe you are someone sat here right now who needs a door of hope to walk through at a time such as this. To step through our doors, something often needs to bring people to our outskirts and our edges in the first place. In Deep and Wide, Andy Stanley writes, there should be something about us that causes people to gather at the periphery and stare. I love that. He also goes on to write, when people tell their faith stories, they always talk about the individuals they believe God put in their paths. I wonder how many of us can attest to that ourselves. Sometimes the task of rebuilding, of restoring, of transforming can seem so big and we wonder if we're up to it. In August, we spent a fantastic holiday week up the road from Nailsworth with my mum and dad. The house that we were staying in had framed Charlie Mackesy pictures in almost every room, and it inspired me to get my book, The Boy, the Mole, the Fox and the Horse out when we got home. I think this illustration sums up so well what I, what I want to say about the task at hand. I'm so small, said the mole. Yes, said the boy, but you make a huge difference. May you have people in your life who don't reduce you, who don't disempower you, who don't make you seem small and unable to change the world. And may you be that someone to other people, letting them know that they are enough. Mother Teresa was so right when she said, not all of us can do great things, but we can do small things with great love. I had the pleasure of teaching Key Stage 2 children for almost 30 years, and I still remember the inspiration that I felt sitting in a dark cinema in the early years of my career as the faces of famous actors, news readers, even the Prime Minister at the time, I think, loomed big on the screen, and each said one name. It was only at the end that I realised what the advert was about when Department for Education flashed up with a strap line, no one forgets a good teacher. As we were coming out of COVID, I thought of that advert again as I went into the office in the academy where my husband was a data protection officer and saw the walls full of inspirational statements that included this one about pupils in relation to their teachers. They may forget what you said, but they will not forget how you made them feel. This sentiment resonates in this section on inwards with a quote that sums up what will keep people coming through the doors of our churches and help them to make the decision to stay. In Simply Church, Sim Dendy writes this profound statement, people don't stay because of our efficient systems, they stay because of the people they meet in our churches and how they make them feel. So often it is doing the small things with great love that makes the huge difference. Before concluding this section, I just want to take a moment to talk about something that I feel not only prevents people from having the courage to come through our door, even if it is a door of hope. 
but also holds many of us back in life and stops us from moving forwards. I first came across this verse in the Holman Christian Standard Bible in 2018 when I was leading my first Beth Moore study on the Psalms of Ascent. This verse gave me for a passion for the Bible like I'd never had before and which hasn't dimmed in the intervening five years. Psalm 120 verses 5 to 6 read, What misery that I have stayed in Meshach, that I have lived among the tents of Kedar. The tents of Kedar were inhabited by nomadic people of the desert. Isn't it so easy for us to also stay scraping a basic existence from our desert places because they have become our familiar comfort zones that have all been all that we've known for so long that we don't seem able to leave them? Hasn't God got more in store for us than scratching around in our stretches of sand. Do you have Meshachs that you too have stayed in for too long? Jen Baker sums up this reluctance to move on so well in Untangled when she writes, most of us know people who have become comfortable in their stalemate. They remain stuck, either ignorant of a different outcome or frozen in place, fearing what change might mean. Fear has the ability to keep us locked in a position we should have left long ago. As I have thought about these things more and more, I've been drawn to the image of bird cages. Several months ago now, Johnny and I joined the National Trust and have loved visits to several properties across England, more often than not, opting for cheese and tuna jacket potatoes with side salad lunches in National Trust cafes, which I would highly recommend. One of our first visits was to Dirham Park near Bath. We were walking through one of the ground floor side rooms when a volunteer called me over and asked if I wanted her to press the big button by her side. Intrigued, I said an emphatic yes. And what suddenly lit up in front of me behind an open door was an incredible Trump Loy painting with a perspective that drew me back and back and back. It was stunning. The guide proceeded to talk about the painting that I was mesmerised by and said that Hoog Stratton, the artist, was a master of imagery. And then I saw it, hanging from the ceiling in the foreground, above the dog and the arch-backed cat, a huge bird cage containing a parakeet. And the thing that spoke to me the loudest was that the door of the cage stood open. The parakeet could be free, Yet, it was choosing to stay. People can live like that, in their familiar comfort zones, which don't do them any favours at all, with the door standing open. Is that you? Back in the early summer, my friend Sue took me to a women's conference in Clevedon, and in the lunch break, we dashed through to an area of great interest to both of us, the room full of stalls selling bookmarks and candles and coasters and cards. The first store that we hit was one selling homemade bags and material cards, etc. As I was buying this one, I said to the lady who made it that I was going to frame it for our day room as it represents something that I feel passionate about. How so often there are people who live in a cage and their cage door is actually standing open and they don't realise it. Or maybe they do. But they've lived in it for so long that it's become their familiar comfort zone, which they choose not to leave. And the talented seamstress in the middle of that hall looked at me with her eyes full of tears and said quite simply, I live in that cage. A woman on a church stall in Clevedon making and selling beautiful things, who lives in a cage, who knows that she lives in a cage, and that knowledge makes her cry. Our inwards always involves movement forwards, and it also often means leaving something behind. Are we brave enough to? I will start my outward section with an exhortation from Theodore Roosevelt to do what you can with what you have where you are. As you here at Bourne well know, Doing your best with what you have isn't always staying inside 
within your four walls. This is the incredible verse in Isaiah 58 that comes before the verse that names us, repairer of broken walls and restorer of streets with dwellings. The Lord will guide you always. He will satisfy your needs in a sun-scorched land and will strengthen your frame. You will be like a well-watered garden, like a spring whose waters never fail. Gardens are outside. People passing by gardens can see them, smell them, enjoy them. Who passes by you day to day? Who do you rub shoulders with in your workplace, your family, your leisure groups, your church community? How can they be blessed by the vibrant colours, scent, tranquility of your refreshing, well-watered garden? How do we irrigate our lives, our attitudes, our relationships with that Isaiah 58 spring whose waters never fail? This is an absolute no-brainer for me. As I mentioned earlier, since 2018, I have been running Bethmore Bible study groups, and it is literally as if the scales have dropped from my eyes where the Bible is concerned. Don't get me wrong, the Bible has always been a central part of my childhood and upbringing, but it has never spoken to me as it has since I've intentionally and consistently studied it. In Timothy 2 verse 9, it reads, but God's word is not chained. I believe that the Bible can reach into any situation, any scenario, any shattered place, any desert, any wilderness. There is nowhere that God's almighty word cannot reach. And I think that we need to remember that at times God calls us to take his never-ending water outwards into those parched places. Isaiah 32 verse 2 exhorts us that each man will be like a shelter from the wind and a refuge from the storm, like streams of water in the desert and the shadow of a great rock in a thirsty land. This is what our outwards looks like. It brings some respite, some refreshment, some hope, something that makes a tangible difference to people's every day. When we set our very roots deep into the watercourse of God's almighty word, we are like the tree of Psalm 1, planted securely by streams of living water, yielding our fruit in its right season and producing leaves that do not wither. When we stand confidently on our foundations of faith, trusting the Lord, it says in Jeremiah 17 that we will be like a tree planted by the water that sends out its roots by the stream that doesn't fear when heat comes. A tree whose leaves remain green and that has no worries in a year of drought. Can that confidence in the Lord really get us through when the heat comes? I said earlier that I meet up with your very own Vicky Payton to chew the cud every few months. I was really pleased when on Saturday the 16th of July I got this photo from her with the message, just bought this on my Kindle, ready for holiday on Friday. I'd recommended a fantastic book to her called Chasing Vines by Beth Moore and as a busy secondary school teacher, Vicky doesn't get a lot of time to read during term time. I knew that she'd be really savouring diving into this on their first holiday abroad for several years. It was a couple of days after they'd gone that prayers were asked for at an Ebby service and a message went out on the Ebby prayer group to hold up John and Karen Payton's son and family trapped out in the wildfires of Rhodes. That was Vicky. A couple of weeks later, safely back home and in that space before she headed off to be a Hill House camp leader, Vicky was sat in my day room recounting the details of it all. How they flew out to Rhodes on the Friday and how the first she knew that there was a problem was on Saturday afternoon when she found ash on the swimming costumes drying on their balcony. By early evening, they could see fire on the hills. Then the sight of panicked tourists wheeling suitcases past the hotel. As they were getting ready for bed, they received the text alert to evacuate and get out and joined the worried lines of suitcase wheelers. 
By the early hours of the morning, they had arrived by coach at a disused, derelict school with no clear idea of what was going to happen next. Can you imagine? And I asked the question, what do you think you would have been like when that heat came? What would I have been like? There will be many people sat here who will no doubt be thinking, oh, I know what it feels like for the heat to come. Boy, do I know. There will be some folk here who don't yet. I say to you this morning that there inevitably will come a time when each of us will metaphorically see fire on our hills and ash on our drying swimming costumes and know that the heat is on its way. I advise, recommend, implore each and every one of you to have your roots down deep into God's never running dry word. It will sustain you. I will finish this section on outwards with a story that illustrates brilliantly how we must never underestimate the distance of our reach. Last October, I was just settling in at a round table of delegates at a mental health friendly church training day led by Patrick Regan, the founder of Kintasugi Hope, when unexpectedly the door opened and a friend who I didn't know was attending came and joined me. We were discussing her very real mental health struggles during COVID and how she'd found herself in a long, very dark tunnel. She told me how she'd been calling out to God desperately throughout it. Where are you, God? Where are you? I suddenly felt a nudge to ask her what brought her out of that particular tunnel. And without missing a beat, she said at the height of the lockdowns, there was a knock on her door and on her doorstep was someone from church who handed her an envelope saying that there was so much that couldn't be done in these times, but this was something that him and his wife could do. She shut the door, opened the envelope and found in it a piece of string with a pair of crocheted hands on the ends. It was quite simply a hug in an envelope. She sobbed and sobbed and sobbed. That was what brought my friend out of her tunnel. Imagine that, a crocheted hug of love, and it's just so doable. As I was speaking at the Torquay Women's Conference in November, I was deep in prep around that time, and suddenly came to a point in Patrick Regan's book, When Faith Gets Shaken, where he tells of how he was struggling a great deal, physically living with constant pain in his leg and back, coupled with eczema brought on by stress, which brought on insomnia. He details how one day in a particularly bleak moment, his wife Diane stepped out of the room to have a minute to herself and to vent to God about the seemingly impossible situation. As she prayed, she saw a picture of a tunnel and immediately thought of the phrase, the light at the end of the tunnel. But in her vision, she couldn't see any light in the distance. The tunnel seemed too long. As she looked again, she saw that the light was around her at the start of the tunnel, not the end. And that image connected so powerfully with me as my mind went back to the conversation I'd had with my friend. And what she said when I asked her what brought her out of her long, dark tunnel. I realised in that instant that the crocheted hug of love, that simple pair of hands in an envelope, was light in her tunnel. Not someone calling encouragement to her from the end of it, in the amazing light that they were stood in and enjoying. It was the light brought to her that spurred her on to keep on putting one foot in front of the other until she emerged relieved out of the other end. What a revelation. In our outwards, let us take that same light into people's tunnels, into their prisons, into their cages, into their leisure activities, into their schools, into their streets, into their hospitals, into their pain. In Matthew 5, verse 14, Jesus said to his disciples, and he also says to us today, you are the light of the world. Let us remember that light always puts out darkness, and darkness can never 
ever extinguish light. In his book, Deep and Wide, Andy Stanley writes this profound statement, if you want me to follow you on a journey, you have to come get me. The journey must begin where I am, not where you are, or where you think I should be. In our outwards, may we go and meet people where they are, in their dark spaces, carrying with us candles, headlamps, flaming torches, flashlights, lit orbs, lanterns that will illuminate the way as we accompany them, relieved out of the other end. And finally, I come to my closing section, Within. When I think about within, I think about those things that lie in the centre of our lived experience, the difficult things that are there side by side and mixed in with all of the other parts that make up life. Those hard things that seem here to stay and that we can't ever really manage to get away from. In this within section, I want to think about what we can do with those difficult things that makes them matter, that makes them count. How we can ensure that nothing is wasted. And I want to complete the circle and bring us back around to where we started, at an entranceway on a threshold, at the opening of a door of hope. Each of us gets the chance to choose whether we walk through that door of hope. George Ellis wrote, hope is faith holding out its hand in the dark. No one else can hold out your hand in the dark. Only you can. Will you choose to? Victor Frankl was a Jewish psychiatrist who experienced several of the death camps during the Holocaust. When the US Army eventually liberated Dachau, he had already lost his wife, his family, and his health. He was a man who knew all about pain and those difficult things lying alongside everything else. Yet, he was able to say these incredible words. Life may have taken things from you that you never thought you would lose, but one thing remains which it cannot take. Your choice as to how you will live tomorrow. A verse that has impacted me so deeply is Job 13, verse 8, in reference to a tree. Its roots may grow old in the ground and its stump die in the soil. Yet, at the scent of water, it will bud and put forth shoots like a plant. Maybe when you look back on your life, you see places where it has grown jaded and old. Stumps where your dreams seemingly died and things didn't turn out like you expected them to. May hope be to you a scent of water, a sense that change is just around the next corner, that seeds in your life are about to germinate and bring forth those longed for shoots. In Me and My Big Mouth, Joyce Mayer writes, probably most of us who are believing God for something can find evidence of a small beginning, a little seed, a cloud the size of a man's hand. Rejoice over that seed. God gives us seed, something that causes us to hope. In the middle of all of my planning, I read a news article about an Orthodox Christian called Karplikov, who escaped with his wife Akulina and nine-year-old son Savin into the taiga forest in Siberia in 1936 to escape religious persecution from the Tsar, by the Tsar. In that snowbound wilderness, two more children were born. The family were only discovered in 1978 by geologists who saw signs of crop growth from the sky. Karplikov told them the story how 17 years before, a late snow killed all of their crops and Akulina succumbed to starvation. Then, one day, he noticed that a single grain of rye had sprouted in their pea patch. He carefully nurtured the plant until they could harvest 18 
grains from it, which allowed them to slowly rebuild their crop. That single sprout of rye didn't come in time to save his wife, but it did come in time to save the lives of him and his three children. One unexpected seed was all that it took. The most helpful thing that I've ever read about making difficult things matter is by Beth Moore when she writes about manure. My favourite topic. This is what she writes in Chasing Vines. From my personal experience and observation, there are plenty of people willing to provide the manure for you. Sometimes it's just a shovelful here and there, and other times you'll feel like a truck load just unloaded on you. At first, the manure that gets heaped on you will appear to have no value at all. You won't seem to learn a thing from it, except perhaps that people can be cruel. You'll go through an ordeal or an attack, an assessment or a critique that even years later you will think had no constructive element whatsoever. It just seems meaningless, but it's not. It's manure. Beth goes on to recommend that when we find a load of unasked for, unwarranted, unwelcome manure unceremoniously dumped on our doorsteps, what we do with it is we metaphorically wheel it out into our garden and dig it in to our borders or put it around the base of our fruit trees. When we produce fruit in the years to come, we can remember that that manure, that very manure, enriched it and helped to make it what it is. Nothing is ever wasted. All of it matters. In closing, I want to return to a story that you probably thought that I'd finished with, but that I hadn't. You see, finding the ash on those swimming costumes was only part of the patent story. Vicky spoke easily, as passionately, as clearly, as vividly to me about a different aspect of their unexpected experiences. It was sobering when she told me of the local inhabitants of the nearby villages who arrived at the disused school the morning after they were evacuated, bearing boxes of bottled water and platters of homemade pastries for the foreigners who had arrived on their burning shore scared, hungry, and tired. Vicky spoke of the woman who insisted on driving the family out to the old town for a bit of respite from the horror of the situation, who, when Mark asked her if she was all right, said that she just heard from her best friend who that day had had to stand and watch her house go up in flames. And Vicky told me of another local woman who insisted on picking the family up at 6.30 a.m., so they'd be on time to catch the ferry out to Kos from where they would fly home. One day, I believe, Mark and Vicky will go back to that singed coast of Rhodes, where they experienced the Isaiah 32, shelter of a great rock, and the Isaiah 58, springs of water in a thirsty land. They will go back and revisit the places where they experienced welcome, resilience and warmth. A place where locals didn't wallow in the unwanted manure unceremoniously dumped on their scorched doorsteps, but who chose instead to rise above it, to dig it in, to make it matter. Simple folk whose manure never led them to forget what it is to be kind. May our inwards, our outwards, and our within always, always be hallmarked with kindness. While we finish with worship, I'd like to make myself available to pray for anyone who, like that woman in Clevedon, knows that they reside in a cage with its door stood open and they want to be brave enough to leave it. Or for anyone who wants to be a yet kind of person, who recognises the scent of water and believes that things are going to sprout afresh for them. Or finally, for anyone who wants to have a greater capacity to carry 
flaming lanterns into people's dark tunnels who wants, quite simply, to be more kind.